invite you to turn in the Mennonite hymnal to hymn number 479. 479. I owe the Lord a morning song. Let's stand and sing. speaker for this entire week. We'll be talking about quarreling under the unpredictable plant, adjusting our sense of pastoral responsibility to the surprises of grace. Eugene? like to thank you for your welcome and your um, <clears throat> appreciation and your receptivity. I feel connected with you. I have, um, I didn't know if we'd connect. Um, we started out as strangers. I don't feel like we're strangers anymore. And I thank you for your warm welcome receiving me. Um, making me feel like a Mennonite. I'd like to gather you in prayer before we start today. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this bright sun coming up over the horizon, pouring light and warmth into our lives, and for your own, pre your own presence here in this place. We thank you for this holy calling that we are in, for brothers and sisters who share it with us, encourage us, help us along the way. And we thank you for these days we've had together as we've tried to deepen our sense of identity, our call. And we thank you for this book, this Jonah book, that has released so many insights among us. Continue to be with us. Continue to deepen your call within us. In Jesus' name, amen. When 
When I was five years old, I would often walk across a meadow between our backyard, which went up against a road, the Meridian Road, and then down maybe 50 feet or so to Ashley Creek to a, the edge of a farm and hang there on the barbed wire strand and watch a farmer plow with his enormous tractor. The thing that I wanted more than anything else at that time in my life was to ride on that huge green John Deere tractor. And one summer day, as I was standing at the fence, I would never have dared to climb through it. I was watching Brother Storm, for that was the farmer's name, plow his fields. He was probably a hundred yards away from me when he spotted me. And he stopped the tractor and he made strong waving motions with his arm like that. And I stood there and watched him. I'd never seen anyone use a gesture like that before. And he looked mean and angry. He was a large man, ominous in those bib overalls and that straw hat. And I knew that I probably was where I shouldn't be. So I turned and left, sadly. I really hadn't felt I was doing anything wrong. I was only watching from what I thought was a safe distance, wishing that someday, somehow, I'd get to ride on that tractor. And I went home feeling rejected, rebuked. Leonard and August Storm were huge Norwegians and forbidding. I was in awe of them. They never smiled. They had a kind of Nordic gloom that just kind of poured through them. And they were members of our church and always sat in the back row with their son who was confined to a wheelchair with muscular dystrophy. They were also rich. At least they were rich by the standards of our working class sectarian congregation. And they had moved into our mountain valley from the plains of eastern Montana where they had reputedly made a lot of money in the grain fields and a couple of oil wells. A nice supplement to grain. Whenever there was need for money in our church, special needs like the furnace needed to be replaced, our pastor would work the fundraising from the pulpit. And um, if we needed, say, $2,000, he'd start out, he had, a, he had a pad and a pencil, and how many will give 20, how many will give 50, how many will give 10, and he kept a running total of what uh, we needed. And when he had um, gotten to the end and, and nothing else was happening, um, the interjected prayers and uh, admonitions had kind of melted the whole thing dry, uh, and then Brother Storm would ponderously rise from his station in the back of the church and say, I'll make up the difference. The difference was always several hundred dollars, and I was always impressed. <laughs> the next Sunday, after my disappointment at the edge of his field, Brother Storm, after church, uh, found me and uh, said, Little Pete, he always called me Little Pete. Why didn't you come out in the field the other day and ride the tractor with me? And I told him I didn't know I could have, that I thought he was chasing me away. And he said, I called you to come. I waved to you to come. Why did you leave? I said, well, I didn't, I didn't know that's what you were doing. He said, what do you do when you want somebody to come to you? And I said, I do this. Well, he, he harumphed. <laughs> Remember that old cartoon about Major Hoople? Well, Brother Storm looked kind of like Major Hoople. He had a large uh, front, and, and, and Major Hoople always harumphed. And, and Brother Storm is the only other person I've ever known outside that comic strip who harumphed. And he harumphed, and he said to me, Little Pete, that's piddling. 
On the farm we do things big. <laughs> well, I was crushed again. I felt small. I was already small on the outside. Now I felt small on the inside. Disappointed, crushed, a little angry too, I suppose. Uh, it's hard to sort out all those feelings from your five-year-old memories. But this gigantic farmer calling me and my world piddling. I was a five-year-old Jonah, displeased exceedingly. I'm not trying to try for anything precise in my comparison with Jonah, but I'm trying to locate the common elements in the failure of imagination that prevented me from enjoying that John Deere tractor ride and the failure of imagination that prevented Jonah from rejoicing in the salvation of Nineveh. I had such a small idea of the world. I interpreted these large, generous actions of this farmer through the cramped, confined experiences of my childhood. And so, of course, I misinterpreted. Like Jonah, hanging on the fence at the edge of Nineveh, waiting to see what happens, and interpreting all the signs out there wrongly. And then angry in his disappointment. Jonah's sulking disappointment under that plant came from a failure of imagination. He had no idea of what God was doing. The largeness of his love and mercy and salvation. He had reduced the world and Nineveh and God to his own idea of it, his own small experience of it. He was in the right place, he was doing the right thing, but he interpreted everything through his Jonah ideas, his Jonah experience. And so he interpreted wrongly. He was probably pleased with himself that he had become obedient but he was inexperienced in God, a stranger to grace. He had a program laid out for Nineveh, but God had a destiny to fulfill in Nineveh. Jonah's program was a little child's index finger, and God's destiny was a huge windmill gesture. Jonah had a child-sized plan that didn't pan out, God had a hugely dimensioned destiny that surprised everyone when it was enacted. Jonah assumed that he knew exactly what God would do. And when God didn't do it, he went into a sulk. God had purposes far exceeding anything Jonah imagined. Now what I want to do today is I want to deal with the daily difficulty that you and I as pastors have in adjusting our sense of responsibility to the surprises of grace. We're in charge of maintaining institutional and moral order in a place that is just seething, brimming with the energies of a creative spirit. And we repeatedly find ourselves at odds with God disappointed and quarrelsome because our procedures, our obedience, didn't work out the way we thought it was going to. And we stand, we stand in our pulpits and extend a little index finger to suggest that these people tidy up their morality, embellish their piety, and God is waving his huge windmill arms and calling them to grace, to mercy, to salvation, and they see him, they hear him, and they bypass us. And we wonder why we don't feel wonderful in that. Jonah seems such a small, forlorn figure, doesn't he? As he's sitting there underneath that plant, waiting to see what God is going to do. He's satisfied when the plant grows and cools him. 
He's displeased when the plant withers and he's parched by the hot sun. How can he be reduced to such puny emotions? Such piddling, I love that word, <laughs> obsessions. Such small comfort, such trite discomfort. Here's a man who's been in and out of the whale's belly, who made the self-sacrificing desire to be a pastor in Nineveh and not a tour guide in Tarshish. A man who has seen Nineveh turn to God, and he's petulant. He's petulant because things didn't turn out the way he expected. His prophecy was not fulfilled. No matter that in his preaching, God was heard and responded to, Jonah was ignored. And Jonah was feeling sorry for himself, quarreling with God under the unpredictable plant. We're reading and pondering this story of Jonah with the hope of having our pastoral vocation clarified and motivated. It's not easy these days to figure out what it means to be a pastor. We're daily confused, at least I am, I think you are too, by anti-pastor models that are suggested and promoted among us. Jonah provides us with a wonderful story that deals with this, these crisscrossing signals and voices and experiences as we pick our way through this, and I think give us some help. In my first lecture, I tried to discern the difference between Tarshish glamour and Nineveh obedience. The touristy glitz of a religious career in contrast to the quite ordinary obedience of a pastoral vocation. In the second lecture, the task was to gain some perspective on our religious culture develop a critical stance so that we wouldn't be taken in by all this well-meaning idolatry. Pastors don't belong on the religious ship at all, and we need to get off, even if it means getting thrown off. In my third lecture, In the Belly of the Fish, we found a context in which to develop a pastoral ascetic, the form and content of prayer they would provide a center and substance to the pastoral vocation. And if there's any place in this, these lectures where I would have liked to have just kept going for another week right on that subject, it's there. In the fourth lecture, yesterday, we determined that the genius of the pastoral vocation was that it works in place, geography, and that the geography is yoked to eschatology, the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. There's an immersion in particulars, no proclamation of impressive abstractions, this immersion in particulars, which is the stock and trade of the pastor, but yoked, linked to this pull to something grand, purposeful, the salvation in Jesus Christ. And now in this fifth and final lecture, I want to see how Jonah is surprised by grace, so taken aback by it that he's disagreeable about it. And this is the adjustment that pastors have to make when we make this transition from doing work for God, in which we expect to have some success, and observing God work through us in ways that we never guessed were possible ways that are much better than we thought possible, but they don't provide those small ego gratifications that we get so addicted to in our Jonah life. So we're going to be talking about creativity, the Holy Spirit's creativity and imagination, which is that part of our lives which is able to apprehend that. I was speaking to a group of seminarians uh, three or four months ago, and um, 
they were, we were on a retreat, and they were getting ready to enter their school term. And um, one of them in the discussion period asked me, what I like most about being a pastor? And sometimes you get answers, you, you say things in those times that turn out to be truer than you thought they were. And I, my spontaneous remark was, I like the mess. I like just that mess of being a pastor. And the tohu vabohu, the chaos, um, entering into people's lives that just are tangled and muddy, and then burying yourself in that, and then slowly finding that there's something going on. The lives coming together, the word of God being heard, um, and, um, and eventually that sense of creativity that works out into something whole, healed, saved, enlightened, motivated. Never know how it's going to turn out. Never know what's going to happen. I like that. I don't enjoy the mess. I, I can't say that. I, that's, but that's, that's always preparatory. The, the pre, this preparing power of chaos, which is at the beginning of Genesis as the creative work starts. When you do something creative, when you're being creative, when you're involved in someone else's creativity, most of what you do doesn't work. You know that. You throw most of your stuff away. Anybody who writes a poem throws away 90 drafts before they get the final one. If you write a story, same thing. Well, when I'm calling for creativity in the pastoral vocation. That we're willing to enter into this mess, which is a congregation. Unfinished stuff. We don't know what's going to happen. But we do believe that the Holy Spirit is hovering over the face of these waters. And the Word of God is calling forth new life, and we can be part of that. But we never know how it's going to turn out. And we throw away most of what we do. Most of what we do turns out not to be very good. And yet you can't be creative otherwise. If you want, to get, if you want guarantees that your efforts are going to work, you have to paint by numbers. You have, to, you have to get things that are all done before you. But that's no fun. You get bored doing that pretty fast. So you learn as you enter into the creative process to love the mess. Remember years ago I was uh, with a friend, well he wasn't a friend, he was an acquaintance, and um, he was leaving, he just accepted a call to another church. He'd, only, he'd been there five years, and uh, now he was going to a church which was um, much larger. And I, I was surprised that he was leaving so soon. I said, Bob, what, what are you leaving so soon for? Now this is one of our uh, in our, I don't know if you have people like this in your church, but this is one of those tall steeple boys we call. And he was good looking, uh, had, a, had a charismatic smile that he used to good effect, and uh, he could make people do things. And he said, well, I've, I've been here five years, I've got my program in place, and it's working. There's nothing left for me to do. And I walked away from that thinking, program, program in place and working, and there's nothing left for me to do. And that just seemed odd. It just struck me as odd. What does a program have to do with creativity? What does program have to do with God and passion? I mean, programs are, are useful and necessary around the periphery. There's some things you have to, some places where you have to paint by the numbers. But at the center, the vocation, the calling of being a pastor program, In my denomination, we have what is called a program agency. And they publish what they call a program calendar, which tells you what to do all year long every week. They have the largest budget in our church. And I throw mine away every year. Not that it's not useful. But that's not what a pastoral vocation is. Pastoral vocation has to do with the creativity of the Holy Spirit 
and are participating in it. Now this is hard to do because we are working between two mindsets all the time that um, interfere with it, diminish it. We work with a mindset that's messianic on one hand and managerial on the other. Now the messianic mindset has to do with helping people and making things better. And all of you are good at this. Um, when I meet somebody, just one of two things happens automatically. I, I don't go through any process of, of sorting out. This just happens. You meet somebody and, a, and within 10 seconds you know this person's hurting. This person's in trouble. And um, so all these, these emotions and feelings, the adrenaline starts to flow. You're going to help. And it's something you're good at. You know you can do something. You've been trained in it. You've been pulled, called. You've been attracted into this way of life because you want to do something for these people. And um, so you become, you fall into the messianic mode. Human beings suffer a lot of damage in the course of their lives. Some of the damage is visible. A crippled hand, a scar on the cheek, an arthritic limb, but most of it is not. Most of it's invisible. Childhood wounds, marital wounds, cultural, racial, sexist wounds. So we watch for clues. We pick up signs. We learn to detect these inner hurts and are motivated to comfort, to help, and to heal. And we're commonly good at this, both by temperament and training. We have a natural desire and capacity to help people, and then we're trained in the best ways of doing it, learning the skills of listening, of counseling, referral. And when we meet somebody and detect this emotional hurt or psychic maiming, we're ready to go to work. We're on the job. We're going to help. This is messianic work, the work of Messiah who made women and men whole. Well, this is good and honorable work. It's also richly rewarding. People like being helped, and they are often grateful for our help. Once in a while, we come across people who are just intractable cases, neurotic blobs, and parasitic ingrates that just clog the arteries of the messianic ministry. But there are enough others who are genuinely helped and appropriately grateful to provide us with almost daily verification that this is good work, worth doing, appreciated. Pastor, I could never have made it without you. Don't you love to hear that? It just, you know, the old red blood just kind of pumps and you just know you're going. But something subtle is going on all the time that this is happening. When I'm helping another, I'm stronger and they're weaker. I'm competent in relation to their incompetence. They're thanking, praising, admiring, while I'm being gracious, understanding, and merciful. I'm doing messianic work, the work of Messiah that Jesus called me into and the church ordained me for, and I'm starting to feel a little bit like Messiah myself. It's a good feeling. It's also addictive. And if they don't come to me, I start going to them, seeking out occasions and people in which this can be reinforced. And at some point along the way, I cross a line. My messianic work takes center stage and Messiah is pushed to the sidelines. But what if this particular person I'm dealing with is involved in some suffering that is somehow or other necessary? An element of cross-bearing or renunciation or sacrifice that is being used by our Lord the Spirit for holiness. What if it's inappropriate right now to help? 
Do I have the reticence, the self-control, the self-discipline, the detachment not to do my messianic will, but stand back and let Messiah maybe call this person to lift a cross, or maybe to be on a cross? Suffering as such is not the scandal of the gospel, not the thing we need to get rid of. So in my messianic compulsiveness, I can very well hinder sanctification in progress. Now the other role that I slip into pretty easily is the managerial role. And this is the mode I slip into when I sense that health is present. I'm quick to pick out a person who has it all together and is a potential worker in the kingdom. Pastors are typically good at this. There's a lot of untapped energy and goodwill in people, especially Christians. There are people who have been blessed with good parents, got a good education, have a satisfactory marriage. Their children all have straight teeth and are on the honor roll. They're sought out as social companions. They earn good salaries on which they tithe. These are the leaders. And when I meet one, my computer mind just runs through a checklist. Youth leader, stewardship chairperson, deacon, church school superintendent. I make mental notes. I file away the information for use in further recruitment. This is a person whom the pastor can now enlist in the leadership of Christ's church. The church is a mission in need of talented and gifted leaders, and here's one right now before me. How can I use this person to the glory of God and the growth of this congregation? This is managerial work, the work of the master who called workers into the vineyard and promised that we would do greater work than he himself did, recruiting, organizing, arranging, motivating. I, like you, are responsible for the management of a religious organization. And if I'm going to do this well, I have to get the best help available and deploy the forces strategically. Now this is good and honorable work. It is also richly rewarding. Most people have strength that needs to be shared, and the pastor is in a key position to direct these energies into channels that nurture the kingdom of God. There is goodwill aplenty in these people. It needs to be tapped and directed. And the church is a major site for this gathering and focusing of spiritual energy. But in the course of doing this, something happens to me, the pastor. I like the exhilaration of all this energy, the hum of organization, the zest of goals. A large part of my identity comes in relationship to the way my congregation is perceived by others. Is it flourishing or is it languishing? Is it exuberant or is it slovenly? As I get people working with me, my image is enhanced. And in the course of doing this, I cross a line. What started out as managing people's gifts for the work of the kingdom of God becomes the manipulation of people's lives for the building up of the pastoral ego. What if this person should not be working right now in this way? What if it's time in the rhythms of grace for the field to lay fallow so that some deep changes can be worked, preparing for new work? Then in my eagerness to manage, I will have hindered sanctification in progress. Now here's the tough part. I cannot be a pastor in this American culture, probably any culture, if I'm not skilled in slipping quite effortlessly from the messianic mode to the managerial mode. Doing good messianic work, doing good managerial work. These are the warp and woof of pastoral living. It's good work, and I'm good at this work. P. 
people expect me to do this work. It's gospel work. I cannot be a pastor and not do this. But both of these high-profile modes, singly and together, crowd against the shy and quiet and mostly invisible work of God and passion, the core of the pastoral vocation. They push it out of the way. This attentiveness to God in people, in yourself, around us, that we're called to do has to take place in conditions which are mostly uncongenial to it. Messianic, managerial, and we can't get out of it. That's the tough part. This is where we have to learn how to do it. And become wary, discerning, suspicious of all of our motives that they become overly messianic, overly managerial, not leaving room for the Spirit. Jonah was messianic and managerial to a T. The two things overcame him. He was going to do God's will in Nineveh. He was going to put those people under the word of God, and God was going to do his work for them. There was no space, no quietness, no wonder, no mystery. He had it all worked out. He had a program for Nineveh, and he was going to take care of it. Our work must be done in the very conditions that interfere with our work, and that's why it's so frequently not done. The setting is not congenial. But I'm not going to accept excuses for myself or for you. Being a pastor who is attentive to God and who enters into a passionate life with God is essential and important, and it's more important than being messianic and managerial, even though we can't function without doing both of those things. I'm not trying to get rid of them, you understand. I'm trying to put them in their place, trying to get them out of the center out of that obsessive, compulsive center that, that is ruining pastors' lives and ruining the congregations that they're part of. In creative work, a lot of the time you stand back and you don't do anything. Other forces are at work, forces you can't control. Adoration, wonder, invisibilities, we're surrounded with invisibilities that we can't map, can't manage, can't use. I sometimes identify my true pastoral work as what I'm doing when I'm not doing anything important. Not doing what I'm paid to do. Not doing what people expect me to do. Not making anything happen. All these people around me all the time God loving them, Christ saving them, the Holy Spirit wooing them, and they don't notice. They've been baptized. They worship with God's people. They receive the Eucharist. They are not much aware of God or Christ or Spirit. Mostly they're aware of getting ahead, obeying orders, checking items off the list. That's not enough. The pastor, you and I, we're set in these communities to insist that it's not enough. To bring to recognition what is blurred and forgotten. To discern the spirit, to name God when the name of God slips their minds. I'm terrible with names, they say. Okay, we say, I understand. Here's Yahweh. This is Christos. This is Kurios. That's what's going on here. I was in my sanctuary. I think it was a Thursday afternoon. I had 13 four-year-old children on the carpet on the chancel steps. It was late February. 
I sat there with them holding a last season's bird nest in my hand and talked about the birds that were on their way back to build nests like this one and bring in the spring that was just about to come. And they were wrapped in attention. I love doing this. We have a nursery school in our church weekday and every two or three weeks these children come over into the sanctuary and I sit down on the floor there with them and tell them a story or sing a song with them. And this day I had a bird nest. These kids are so alive, so fresh. Their imaginations are lithe and limber. The winter was receding, the spring was coming. It hadn't quite arrived, but there were signs. And it was the signs that I was talking about. This bird nest to begin with. You looked at it and it's weedy and gray and dirty. But as we looked at it together, we started seeing the invisible. The warblers were on their way north from South America. We counted them. We looked up in the sky and we started counting them, figuring what color they were. And then we started looking at the pastel and spotted eggs that were in this nest. We looked out through the walls of the church to the warming ground and we began to see little buds start to form underneath the earth all those earthworms down there turning somersaults. And we started looking, imagining those trees that were just about to burst into, into a leaf. Spring in Maryland, I don't know what it's like here, but in Maryland, spring is just glorious. It's just a riot of color. The forsythia and the red bush and the shad bush, uh, crocus, tulips, uh, Judas trees. They just, it's just a riot of color. Everything just explodes like a great parade. I, 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 I've been living in these for 30 years now, and I'm, I still get caught every time by surprise. I grew up in, in Montana where spring was mostly mud, and we just, we went from, well, you've, you know what that's like. But in Maryland, it's full of color and birds. We're on a migratory flyway where I live, and and the birds just pour through there. Well, I had these kids and, and we were getting prepared. I was getting the children prepared for spring, all these glorious gifts that were going to be showering in on, us, in on us in a week or so. And we were looking at this bare bird nest, seeing all these colors, hearing the songs, smelling the blossoms. Now there are moments in this kind of work when you, knew, when you know you're just doing everything right. This was one of those moments. The children's faces were absolutely concentrated. We'd slipped through a time warp. And we were all experiencing this full sensuality of the Maryland spring. And they weren't looking at this bird nest anymore. They were seeing birds, hearing birds, seeing flowers, seeing trees. And then abruptly, at this moment of high holiness, Bruce, four-year-old Bruce, said, Why don't you have any hair on your head? <laughs> Why didn't Bruce see what the rest of us were seeing? Why hadn't he made that transition to seeing the invisible? that we had all made. All he saw was that visible patch of baldness on my head, which was a fact, but not a very interesting fact, <laughs> while all the rest of us were seeing these multi-dimension truths, real truths, only four years old, and Bruce's imagination was already crippled. usually doesn't happen this early. <clears throat> Childhood is uh, naturally rich in imagination and often usually has a built-in immune system to the cultural poisons that destroy it. 
But sometimes the immune system, unsupported by stories and songs, succumbs to the poison gas of television, and you end up with a Bruce. Those of us who are made in the image of God have, as a consequence, image, imagination. Imagination is the capacity to make connections between the visible and the invisible, between heaven and earth, between present and past, between present and future. For Christians, whose largest investment is in the invisible, the imagination is indispensable. For it is only by means of the imagination that we can see reality whole and in context. What imagination does with reality is the reality that we live by. When I look at a tree, most of what I see, I don't see at all. I see a root system beneath the surface sending tendrils down through the soil, sucking up nutrients out of the loam. I see the light pouring energy into the protoplast-packed leaves. I see the fruit that's going to appear in a few months. I stare and stare and see bare branches, austere in next winter's snow and ice and wind. I see all that. I really do. I'm not making it up but I couldn't photograph it. I see it by means of the imagination. And if my imagination is stunted or inactive, I will only see what I can use or what is in my way. In other words, I will only see as a messiah or as a manager. Jeshla Milaj the Nobel Prize winning poet. He has a great passion for God. And that passion is supported and deepened by his imagination. He said in an interview a couple years ago, he's Polish, and so he has somewhat the advantage of an outsider coming in and, and looking at our country. He said that the minds of Americans have been dangerously diluted by explanation. And he's convinced that our imagination deficient educational process has left us with a naive picture of the world. In this naive view, the universe has space and time, but nothing else. All you see is a bird's nest. No values. No God. Functionally speaking, visibly, men and women aren't that different from a virus or a bacteria or some speck in the universe. Milaj sees the imagination and especially the religious imagination, which is the developed capacity to be in reverence before whatever confronts us. He sees this as the shaping force of the world we really live in. Imagination can fashion the world into a homeland as well as into a prison or a place of battle. It's the invisibles that determine how you will view the world. You hold that bird nest congregation in your hand. What do you see? It's your imagination that shapes your life and how you're going to respond to it. Nobody lives in an objective world. We only live in a world that's filtered through the imagination. And the imagination is almost the same thing as we call faith. Maybe it is the same thing. One of the evils of our time, and too often unremarked, is the systematic degradation of the imagination. The imagination is among the chief glories of the human. When it's healthy and energetic, it ushers us into adoration and wonder into the mysteries of God. When it's neurotic and sluggish, it turns people and pastors, God help us, into parasites, copycats, couch potatoes. And the American pastoral imagination today is distressingly sluggish. 
most of what is served up to us as the fruits of the imagination is, in fact, a debasing of it into some do-goodism program or soap opera entertainment. And I think one of the chief essential Christian ministries now among pastors in our ruined world is to recover this use of the imagination. Ages of faith have always been rich in imagination, and it's easy to see why. The materiality of the gospel, the seen, heard, touched Jesus, is no less impressive than its spirituality, faith, hope, love. Imagination is the tool, the human tool we have for connecting the material and the spiritual, the visible and the invisible, earth and heaven. We have a pair of mental operations here, imagination and explanation. They're designed to work in tandem. When they work together, the gospel is given a robust and healthy expression. Explanation pins things down so we can handle and use them. Obey, teach, help, guide. Imagination opens things up so that we can grow into maturity, worship and adore, exclaim and honor, follow and trust. Explanation restricts, defines, and holds down. Imagination expands, lets loose. Explanation keeps our feet on the ground. Imagination lifts our head into the clouds. Explanation puts us into harness, Imagination catapults us into mystery. Explanation reduces life so that it can be used. Imagination enlarges life so that it can be adored. But our technological and information-obsessed pastoral mindset has cut imagination from the team. In the life of the gospel, where everything originates and depends on what we cannot see, and is worked out in what we can see, explanation and imagination cannot get along without each other. And I think it's time to get aggressive. For pastors to recognize and honor and commission ourselves and each other and, and friends as masters of the imagination. Get our poets and our singers and our storytellers as allies, partners in evangelical witness. How else is Bruce going to hear the gospel when he grows up? How is he going to hear Isaiah's poetry, Jesus' parables, John's visions? It's going to be a sad day if when he's 40 years old he enters a congregation of worshiping Christians and ministering angels and all he sees is a preacher's bald head. Jonah somehow lost his imagination. In quarreling with God, he showed his lack. God was not a literalist. And Jonah was angry and disappointed. Jonah messianically taking charge of the destiny of the Nineveh congregation, and then angry when his will was not done. Jonah managerially lining up the people for an evaluation review for judgment, and then angry when the whole thing turned into a singing and dancing celebration. What's God doing anyway? Why'd you bring me to this place if it wasn't to do my job, to manage, to Messiah? Jonah making his small finger gestures to which he had reduced his pastoral work, and then puzzled an angry, quarreling, petulant, when God was calling people with these huge, merciful, everlasting arms into the kingdom. You might be interested in the end of that story I started out with. Two or three weeks later, I was standing at that fence hanging on the barbed wire again, and Brother Storm stopped his tractor out in the middle of the field, and he did it again. He waved his arms, and that time I crawled through the fence and ran and climbed up on his tractor 
and had one of the wonderful rides of my life. And I think Jonah might have done that too. I don't think he stayed under that withered plant. I think at some point God reinvigorated his imagination and he went back into Nineveh no longer just a bird's nest to be destroyed but a spring a resurrection spring a congregation living to the glory of God with a Jonah creative willing to live in the mess willing to live modestly in the midst of this glorious work of a mercy for God. Amen. Once again, we'll take a few minutes if you'd like to uh, ask questions of Jean, uh, share a response. Uh, we'd be glad to have that. Keith. I'm just a little surprised that you didn't see the connection between your bald head and the barren ground and the roof. That was probably more close to that the kids imagining what, what you would look like with a little bit of hair. Thank you for that word of grace. This lecture would have been different. <laughs> I think there might have been other things that were just as good that I would have experienced along the way. Uh, but that, that certainly was, you know, a, a child experience of, of that largeness, it really was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Isn't it nice? It doesn't have a tidy ending, and uh, we're we're left to uh, be grateful to him. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I feel we can learn from our Jewish brothers and sisters when they translate into English those first verses of Genesis. <coughs> Uh, they're wary of uh, Trinitarianism, and they said, and they write, the wind of God was moving across the face of the waters, and I think probably Holy Spirit reduces a tornado to something uh, weaker than existence. Good point. Yeah, that's. With something powerful, stormy, scary, maybe. Okay, Richard. Oh, just there's one more here. Um, I'm thinking about how our educational system, including pastoral education, seems, in my experience, to deal so much more with the explanation than with the imagination. And I'm feeling, you know. Fairly starved in my own world, you know, in the imagination land, and uh, maybe a little overdone on the explanation land. I, I, I guess Do you have fantasies about what that might mean for pastoral training. Well, I don't have any responsibility for pastoral training, so I don't think a whole lot about that. But I do think about pastors now, and I just, you know, find ways to feed your imagination. Read novelists, read poets, uh, 
find these companions so that all this rich part of your life gets developed and, and supported. You realize how important it is. Um, you know, this is this is not option. I don't think. I don't think this is this is center, and uh, and we must take charge of our lives so that we work well uh, with with skill and passion and with God at the center of this. So there are ways in which we can we can um, do remedial work on our imaginations, and not just um, bitch about what the seminary did to us. <laughs> not productive work. Yes. I'd, I'd like to add a comment to that as well. Uh, I think it's Madame Langle in, in Walking on Water. Uh, I think it's there where she talks about the arts being one of our basic necessities. Arts are not luxuries. That's right. Yeah, thank you. Yes. My wife sitting by my side here reminded me that our imagination gets tested every day by our three and a half year old. Perhaps we need to, like you, spend more time with children as pastors and as persons that uh, sometimes dismiss the children rather than listening to them and being trained by them in the imagination. Good point. Yeah. Hang around the kindergarten, the nursery. not. <laughs> I have a few very mundane, mundane uh, unimaginative things to deal with here this morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to call your attention once again to the evaluation forms which you were given in the registration packet. We'd like to hear from you very much in terms of your feedback for this year, as well as suggestions and comments for uh, future uh, pastors' weeks at AMBS. Also, again, uh, I should call your attention to the fact that the tapes uh, which a number of you are ordering, will not be available at the end of the Pastors Week today, but instead will be mailed to you within uh, 10 days or two weeks. Uh, an announcement was given to me that uh, Mark Ellis is going to be on campus. He will be meeting with uh, interested persons at noontime. I forget uh, the room that's been assigned, but check the flashboards in the main building over there. Mark is uh, a Jewish uh, theologian who's interested in the Middle East. Uh, I'd also uh, appreciate it if you would drop your name tag holders in a box provided on the registration table. That provides uh, the opportunity for recycling those. There are also a few lost and found items uh, back on the registration uh, table. I would also invite all of you to return again at uh, 10.30. Uh, we, we will be having a worship uh, experience, a wrap up for the whole week and we'll be hearing from June Alleman Yoder uh, preaching on the theme of the plant. I think this will be, uh, in relation to the other worship experiences, uh, briefer. Uh, we know that uh, many of you are traveling long distances and would like to get started, so we will not uh, prolong uh, the worship this morning. I'd like to just take a few minutes here now to also uh, recognize persons who have been involved in the week and give my uh, expression of gratitude and thanks as well as uh, gratitude on the part of the planning committee. For all the resource persons, I recognize that uh, a number of those persons uh, are gone, but I see Henry Schmidt is still with us this morning. So Henry, uh, thanks to you and to the others of you, to the preachers uh, each day, thanks for your special contribution to us. I'd like to especially uh, note the good work uh, of the worship leaders, Marion Bontrager and Judy Harder. I told them ahead of time that I think this is a, a real opportunity uh, for ministry to come here and to lead 
pastors in worship because pastors oftentimes are leading worship themselves and caught up in, as it were, the mechanics of it and really can't fully worship. And so it's a good opportunity to help pastors to worship without having the responsibilities. And I think they performed that task admirably this week. Also to Janine Bertie Johnson for a very nice job in helping to coordinate the music and to work along with uh, the worship leaders and Ruth Yoder on the, on the piano and the singers. To the planning committee members, uh, they're all listed on the back of the uh, block schedule for the week. Uh, I won't name them by name, but they have been very helpful in pulling things together. Two persons behind the scenes that I'd like to recognize are Bev Sawatsky and Mary Stelsus. Uh, Bev has done very much in terms of pulling together the details, uh, providing uh, support to the committee and to myself, and uh, has taken a real load off of me this week, as well as in the planning stages beforehand. And Mary, uh, as always, has done a very nice job in pulling together the snacks downstairs, as well as coordinating housing. And then to Eugene. Uh, finally, uh, but not last and uh, not least, by all means. You know, I've been trying to think a little bit as to how I would characterize you, uh, Eugene. <laughs> If somebody were to ask me, uh, what was this Eugene Peterson uh, like as a main resource person uh, at AMBS Pastors Week? And uh, I must say, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled. I, I came up with this long string of adjectives and, and always ended up with Presbyterian at the end. And, and uh, the adjectives were more important than what, what was being modified. Uh, and I'm not even going to risk sharing that with you. But I, <laughs> I would say, I would say uh, two things. Uh, first of all, uh, many of you here are aware of the fact that I spent 10 years of my life uh, as an editor. And one of the little things that we say as editors oftentimes is that when we assign an article or a book assignment to somebody, we're not really always sure quite what it is we're looking for. And we only know it when we see it. Uh, well, I was not even quite sure what it was we were asking you to do here uh, this week. Uh, but what we asked for, you gave us. <laughs> So instead of trying to characterize you, I would say uh, this about your presentations. They were imaginative, creative, literate, humorous, provocative, challenging, and spirit-filled. But most of all, I think we will remember you and your presentations for your great love of God and your passion for life. And for that, we both thank you and God. Okay, we'll take a break at this time. and. Uh, be back in here a little before 10.30 so we can begin worship promptly. Thank you very much.